Do you want to be the coolest kid in your neighborhood? Do you want to be the envy of your friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and pretty much anyone in society? Well, then you've picked the right instrument, the banjo. Specifically, claw hammer banjo. So this is basically a bit of a lesson zero for the claw hammer banjo. So just to play what that is exactly, I'm not really going to be going into tons of detail about how to play this or that. It's very much a kind of, maybe you've just bought your banjo, or maybe you're about to buy a banjo type of lesson. So I'll cover some of the most basic things, kind of generally how to use it, and maybe some of the history of it, but it's not gonna be super in depth. If you already got a banjo and you already feel like you know this stuff, you may as well skip to another lesson. I'm gonna have another one out soon, covering the kind of basic techniques of how to play it. So let's just start with the banjo itself. Maybe you've, you've already bought one or you're thinking of buying one, but what we're talking about here when we're talking about claw hammer banjo is a five string banjo. You can get four string banjos, like tenor banjos and plectrum banjos, but that's not what we use for this. The claw hammer technique can actually be used on virtually any stringed instrument, technically. I've never seen it tried on a violin, but it could be. Hmm, yeah, that doesn't work. But you see it on like acoustic guitar quite a bit. Um, but it's most commonly played on this, the five string banjo. Uh, it's also the same type of banjo that is used for the three-fingered Scruggs style, which I don't teach. So this is tuned to an open G chord, five strings. This is the fifth one here, this tricky little one with the uh, the shortened bit, the peg right here, midway down the neck. So it's higher in pitch. So yeah, as I said, it's tuned to a G chord. We have D string, we have a G string, a B, a D, and another G. So you'll notice that there's a few strings are uh, repeated basically in different octaves if you've not done any music before you might not know what that means but that's perfectly fine we'll get to that at some point so the banjo itself is very similar to a guitar an acoustic or electric guitar has six strings and it's tuned from lowest to highest we have this weird little string which is higher even though it's physically where we'd expect the lowest strings to go it's kind of just one of the quirks of the banjo uh, it's basically kind of a snare drum with strings over it uh, and a wooden neck so these are tuning pegs, this is the neck, we call these metal bits the frets. Um, basically, the closer towards this end they are, the higher in pitch they are. This is lower, this is higher. Uh, the strings go from low to high, and then, as I said before, another high one up here. Something that can be confusing to people when they first start is when we say go, for example, go up a fret, it means go up in pitch. And if we say go up a string, it also means go up in pitch. People tend to think that because because we hold the banjo like this, this up here, that this is up and this is down because it is physically down and physically up, but it's the other way around. Um, yeah, people have that issue playing, in my experience, playing bass or guitar or whatever, but you just get used to it. You just have to remember that up is pitch and down is pitch. Physically, we don't talk about physically going up or physically going down necessarily for the most part. So the strings are kept up to pitch by these tuning pegs. And then we have what we call the nut here, which keeps the strings in place there. And we have a bridge here at this side, which keeps the uh, strings in place there. On a guitar, for example, this is kind of screwed in place. It's, it's mo movable, but on a banjo, it's very movable. It's, it's not glued down or, or, or screwed down or anything. Very movable. This is kind of important. We want this to be in the right place because if it's in the wrong place, the tuning will all be wrong. I'm not going to go into tons of detail about that here. Just as a general overview, that's how it works. So if you've just got a banjo, the first most important thing is just making sure it's in tune. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail about how to make sure that this uh, bridge is in place. As I said before, it will change the correct tuning, but it kind of needs a, a bit of time spent uh, looking into it by itself. You'll probably Google that and find it on YouTube or just information on a website for that. To keep the banjo in tune, what you'll want to do is get a tuner of some kind. You can get these chromatic tuners. I would always recommend a chromatic tuner rather than a specifically guitar or banjo tuner. Uh, a lot of the apps that are available are really good and they, you can usually find a free one whether you're using an iPhone or Android. But don't go for one that calls itself a banjo tuner, just go for a chromatic one because it will actually be better or easier to use um, than, than an actual specifically banjo one. I've never found those very useful whatsoever. Basically, what we want to do is tune these strings to the right pitches. To do that, you'll have to get your tuner. Every interface will be slightly different, but the notes we're aiming for, and usually there'll be a display showing whether it's flat or sharp, you'll kind of have to go through and work it out yourself, um, is a D note. A G note, a B note, a 
another D note, nearly forgot there, and a G note again. Now you'll notice that even though these two are D notes, they're not the exact same pitch. They're actually an octave apart, and it's the same for these two G notes. If you're new to music, again, I think I said this earlier, you might not know exactly what that means, but you'll understand over time. And the important thing for now is to just try to get it in tune. So once it is in tune, we basically have a chord already. That is a G chord. A lot of tunes on the banjo tend to be either in G or closer related keys. For example, E minor, maybe D major or C major. You can also tune your banjo to other tunings, but this is the most common one by far because it is the easiest. It's just the most used. Uh, you'll find that most tunes you're going to learn will just be straightforwardly in what we call open G tuning, which is this. So that's a general view of the banjo. I've not really gone into tons of detail, but I think that's enough for now. We'll go into the actual claw hammer technique a little bit more in future episodes, but for now, a just kind of general overview that we'll do as well. So the claw hammer or frailing stand is actually pretty unique uh, in Western music. There's nothing quite like it. Uh, slap bass. If you know of, say, Flea or Mark King from level 42, or I don't know, there are tons of slap bass players. Um, is kind of similar, it's almost the inverse of it. So it's very different. It's different to plucking with your fingers. It's different from strumming really, although it kind of looks like it. It involves, and again, this isn't really a lesson in that, but generally speaking, it involves a down stroke with the backs of your fingernails uh, and then a, a pluck with the thumb. And it's really just those two basic movements that can turn into, you know, whole pieces of music from that. Uh, but it, it really is quite simple. But yeah, it, it is basically just two straightforward movements. That's essentially all we have in claw hammer banjo, uh, but that can turn into tons of things. You know, from that, that simple beginning can come tons of different types of music. So as I said earlier, the claw hammer or frailing style is pretty unique in Western music, but it's not so unique when you start looking around the entire world. So I remember going on holiday about 10 years ago to Morocco, and I saw these people playing these instruments that I think were called Sintir or Gimbri, uh, and they basically played in a very, very claw hammery way. It was really interesting. I wasn't expecting to see that there. Um, there are also a few West African instruments that are played claw hammer style. One of them is called the Akonting. It's this accounting that we assume today the modern banjo came from. African slaves were taken over to America and they brought with them these instruments and this style of playing. And over time that developed into what is now recognizable as this instrument you see before you. The banjo has a bit of a checkered past then and throughout the 19th century was most heavily associated with racist minstrel music. Today the banjo as an instrument is most commonly associated with bluegrass and country music. You see it in plenty of folk as well. Uh, you will occasionally see it in a rock or pop song but not very often at all. Even if you do it's probably going to be the three fingered stroke style or some kind of plectrum style. Um, for example, if you take Mumford & Sons, which are probably the most obvious kind of visible example of uh, banjo in pop music today. So beyond all that, it's probably worth me giving a bit of a note about music generally. If you're completely or almost completely new to music, this will be valuable. So it's a bit cheesy, but music is best seen as a language in its own right with its own vocabulary and accents, I guess. Just like, say, the English language is fundamentally just a handful of sounds that we can put together into a near infinite amount of words, music is really just a handful of elements that we can turn into a million different songs or instrumentals or symphonies or whatever. So the different elements of music are, and I'm just gonna mention them briefly here, the different elements of music are rhythm. We all know what that is, it's what we tap our foot to, um, it's what we count, you know, one, two, three, four, usually in music. Just like any element in music, we can pretty much do whatever we want with that. We don't always count to four, sometimes it's five. We can split beats up into whatever we want. I'm not gonna go into tons of detail. The next one is pitch. Pitch is just how low, well it's not even that low, low or high uh, a note is. One note at a time basically makes us a melody. For example that. 
Um, two notes at a time gives us harmony. Well, two or more notes at a time gives us harmony. That's a chord progression, for example. The next one is timbre or tone. It's what makes every instrument sound unique. So a banjo sounds very different to an acoustic guitar or a flute or I don't know, a bassoon or something like that. Um, on a banjo, we're pretty limited to just like one tone. We can alter it a bit by playing in different parts of the instrument, but it's not a huge kind of range. If you want a huge range of tones, you're probably best suited to an electric piano or an electric guitar. And then the last one is dynamics, which is basically the volume at which we play. We can play quietly or loudly. I could play louder, but I doubt my audio interface would like that. That's pretty much it. And any of these elements can be changed to suit whatever you're trying to do. There's theoretically pretty much a limitless amount of potential things you can do with those variables, which is why we're still making music after a few thousand years. As you learn more about music and you learn to play more, you'll fill in your understand of rhythm, timbre, pitch, and all that. And it's pretty much an endless journey of discovering new things. Just like learning a language, there's always another word to learn or a book you can read that rearranges the words you already know into something completely new. So I've not really played the instrument at all. And I've not really taught anything in this lesson. This is just really an overview. That's why it's a lesson zero. So maybe you have just bought your instrument or you're thinking of buying one. Hopefully this has just demystified the banjo a little bit in preparation for number one when we actually start to play the instrument. These lessons are going to take it really quite slow, um, but I think it's really super important to get the first few steps on an instrument right. They'll be nice and short as well, and they're only going to introduce a couple of new things every video. The structure is just like the actual lessons I give to people. Um, anyway, that's the end of it. See you around.